Well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Alyssa Travitz. I'm at the University of Michigan. I'm a PhD student. Um, but today I'll be talking not about my thesis work, but about Simiac, um, an open source software package that um, originated here at the University of Michigan. Um, and just a quick background on Syniac and, and who the team is. Um, we are five maintainers and three committers, of which I'm one, um, but we have over 45 contributors, um, 40 cited papers, um, and we are NumFocus affiliated projects. So just to give some context, um, about half of us are still at the University of Michigan, but we have um, we have maintainers and committers in several different countries. So we are very distributed um, and we are an open source project. So the motivation behind Syniac um, is essentially this, which is that there are two common approaches to file naming an organization um, when you're doing academic research. And typically people go for very long file names. Um, so you just start appending uh, a, a new variable every time. Um, or you have these very deeply nested directories. And this is great if you know exactly what your data is going to look like at the end of your project. Um, but that almost never happens in academic research or ever. And so that raises the question, how do you introduce a new parameter? And how can you quickly check to see what parameter space you've already analyzed, what has yet to be analyzed, what is the status of your project, how do you quickly get information? So those are the two main motivations for the Syniac framework. Um, and Syniac can be broken down into two separate packages. So it originated as Syniac, the data management framework, um, and then evolved to include Syniac Flow, which is um, our workflow management framework. So um, to be more specific and give an example, um, Syniac, instead of having this nested file, uh, nested directory structure or these very long file names, we instead stratify everything and everything belongs to a single workspace and every what we call job is unique and has a specific hash ID. So while this may look like um, nonsense here, what this actually is, is making sure that every single parameter that you're running is unique. So for example, if I'm running a study and I know I'm varying the number of particles, the pressure of my simulation, the volume of my simulation, maybe how long I'm equilibrating it for, for me as a, a material scientist, I would run this over a very large parameter space and I would want to know that each one of those are unique. And so each of these jobs has a unique state point, which is this dictionary that describes all of the parameters that are intrinsic to all of the data within that workspace or within that directory. And then in that same directory is all of the accompanying data for um, for that state point. So you can have lightweight metadata and something we call the job document, and then you can have any file type, any extra data um, stored within that directory. So everything is just one directory deep, all belonging in the workspace, and each of them are guaranteed to be unique because they're defined by these dictionaries that live in a single file called the um, Syniac state point JSON file. So that's our approach to managing um, your, your data space. And then when it comes to operating on it, so I said, we want to know what, ha what data has been analyzed, what is the status in our whole uh, workflow pipeline is where Syniac Flow comes in. So Syniac Flow takes anything that you can do to your data space and you define it as a Python function. So, let's say I want to have a function called calculate that's going to take my volume and divide it by the number of particles. I can access the, um, I can access the volume and the number of particles from the Syniac state point um, for every single job in the workspace. And what Syniac flow allows me to do is iterate over any job in the workspace and um, operate on it using this function. So also I know that uh, at CSV conference that there's probably a lot of people that are doing data 
uh, management type solutions. And so I want to be really clear about what we're good for and what we're not good for and sort of what our, our, who our target audience is and what problems we're trying to solve. So we're very good for managing file-based heterogeneous data. So um, I gave a very brief example just now, but it's very good for when your data is messy and ha has a lot of different, um, yeah, if it's very heterogeneous. So you don't have to have this nice uniform um, where everything is perfectly defined and organized. It's very good for messy data. Um, it's also very good for searching and accessing the data within Python or on the command line. So um, you really can use any tool you want as long as it can be run on the command line, um, but it's very Python friendly. Um, and it's very good for scalable and reproducible workflows. I say scalable um, to mean that it's very easy to go from your first prototype of something to working on a small project. This is not scaling in the sense that some other people here might be referring to scaling. Um, and it's very good for, for making reproducible, reproducible workflows because um, it really kind of forces you to do things in a very modular and well-documented way. Um, and with that, with that, it's also good for prototyping. So what it does is it really encourages best practices as you're doing the very first like nuptial part of your um, data science workflow. Um, as I said, it's really good for integrating with existing tools. So anything you can access on the command line can be integrated into Syniac. And what Syniac is not good for is, as I said, with uh, the scalability, once you get over about 100,000 individual jobs, so that's like individual um, directories in that workspace directory, that's when we start to sort of see uh, poor performance. So this is not for um, enormous data sets. Um, this is meant for developing things very quickly and being very agile. It's also not great for existing databases. So if you have um, a lot of distributed data, this is not for you. Um, and if you have purely tabular data, it's going to be overkill. So getting that out of the way, um, we're going to just go through an example and quickly see how some of these features work. Um, this is not uh, all of the features by far. It's very flexible. It's very powerful. So I encourage you to um, please ask me follow-up questions in the Slack after this um, and or go to our documentation, which I'll link to at the end. So this is a um, an example that was a course project by one of our maintainers, Bradley Dice, um, along with two other classmates. Um, and they were looking at um, the network structure of air, uh, U.S. air traffic. And we don't really need to get into the details, but I like to use this just as sort of a, a way for us to conceptualize how Syniac integrates with a data science problem. So I'll cover the data management side as well as the workflow, uh, Syniac flow side. So if we know that we want to analyze um, U.S. air traffic, and we need to first create a parameter space. So we know that we want to look at how um, track patterns have changed over time. So let's first initialize a parameter space with all of the, the range of years and the quarters within those years that um, we want to investigate. So really all this requires is uh, a tiny nested for loop where you can see that we initialize the project and then um, with that project um, we can open a job just by defining the dictionary that will uniquely identify them um, and then initialize it. So what this does is if you then try to go back and reinitialize um, and make a duplicate state point parameter, um, or a, state, a duplicate state point, it won't allow you to do that. It will make sure that every single thing is unique and it won't create redundant directories. So what this for loop would do is create a, a data struct or a, a workspace that looks something like this, where you have um, each of these would be, a, each of these points would be a directory within your workspace and they are varying over a year and then over quarter. And we specifically um, separate quarters from years because the way that the data is analyzed depends on which quarter the, um, the data is from. 
So for example, if we would go into one of these directories, uh, let's say this is its hash ID. So this would be the, the name of the directory. And then the JSON file within that directory would just contain the dictionary year 1994 and quarter four. So then once we have that, that, um, that workspace, let's say we leave and we come back a year later and we want to know what, um, what this workspace contains and what range of parameters it covers. And so we can do that easily with a command syntax schema, which we can just run on the command line and it will quickly tell us what, um, what the range of parameters and the data types for them are. Um, you can imagine that this is much more useful when you have larger dimension, dimensions of data. Um, and same thing with querying. So we can use syntax find, which will tell us um, which jobs match a specific query. So if we want to know which jobs are um, corresponding to the year 1994, it will slice our workspace and tell us which job um, which job directories or the, the hash IDs that correspond to them um, corresponds to the year 1994. So we can do much more complex filtering, but this gives you an idea of how you would um, access the data once it's been initialized in Syniac. And then when we want to um, mo modify a workspace, this is where Syniac is actually very powerful because it allows you to um, modify it with while maintaining the integrity of your data. So if we want to add country as another um, parameter, we can just iterate through all of the jobs and add another parameter. We can also re and rename an existing state point if we decide that now we want to capitalize quarter, for example. Um, but you see how this could be very useful if we want to change to a different naming convention um, and not worry about um, invalidating any of your data. And then with the Syniac flow side, so this is actually how do we go in once we've decided what parameters we want to investigate, how do we actually go in and do the data science on it? So if we have an idea of for each of these um, directories, we have a corresponding state point of what year, what quarter, and we know that we can access from, um, in this case, it was from a government website that had traffic data corresponding to those years and quarters, um, we can have a fetch data operation. And then once we have acquired that data, it's going to pull everything down and there's going to be a lot of data cleaning that needs to be done. So let's say that every single directory now has a readme.html file that we don't need and is going to get in the way of our data analysis. So let's, um, so in order to go through and clean out these unnecessary files, um, we would set up a flow operation. So this function is a flow operation. Um, the only thing that makes it special is that it has this project.operation decorator and it takes job as an argument. Um, and then we also have these pre and post conditions, which is what sets this up in a, a flow diagram type structure. Um, and so you can see that a precondition here is uh, underneath my circle, um, fetch data, and another precondition is has readmes. So this makes sure that this operation is only run if a readme exists. And the way that we find that is now there's a function called has readmes, which is just a simple one-liner that checks to see if um, uh, if a readme exists in the file. Um, and so, and then I do want to mention there's also this functionality called labeling, which is very useful when you want to see the status of your overall project. So what this looks like is if you run Python project dot pi status. So project dot pi is what contains all of your uh, functions. So everything that I just showed in the last slide. And because we've assigned has readme's as a label, it will tell you what percent of um, of operations this is valid for. Um, and so you can see that we also have the function fetch data and it will tell you how many jobs are eligible to be run um, so that if you would run this workflow, it would um, run fetch data on 104 eligible jobs and run remove readme's on 104 eligible jobs. And then once that has run, these would say zero. So finally, um, that 
I'm going to go over just a few other um, things that if you're interested, you can look at on our documentation or our homepage. Um, this was a very high level overview with a very simple example, but I'm happy to answer more specific use cases. Um, but something that we're very good at is automated cluster submission. So this is, um, if you're working on several different supercomputers, we have custom templating so that you can simply run a uh, Python project submit and uh, Syniac will take care of all of the queuing and um, uh, how many CPUs you need parallelizing all of that. Um, and it does all that with cluster specific templating. So if you have a cluster that we don't already support, you can easily write your own and then have it automate for you. Um, it's good for exporting for data sharing. So if you have a collaborator that you that doesn't use Syniac, or if you um, want to archive something, you can export to that nested directory structure and you can convert back from nested directory structure to Syniac. Um, and we also have Syniac dashboard, which I'm just plugging here, but I encourage you to look at it on our website, um, which is uh, the third in the Syniac, Syniac flow, Syniac dashboard, um, which allows you to view graphical output um, in a very uh, interactive way. It's in, we also um, have some new features like uh, groups, which allows you to group those web operation functions um, to do more complex workflows and more complex submissions. We integrate with pandas and HDF5 data stores, um, and we have container support uh, with Docker and Singularity. So that's everything that I wanted to cover today. Um, please go to syniac.io if you're curious about our project. Um, follow Syniac Data on Twitter, and we're very active on our Slack. If you have any questions, if you just want to know more about the project, um, come say hi. Our Slack is linked to on our homepage. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, um, we have about uh, two minutes for questions, and so I'm going to check the queue. And so uh, one question that came up from the audience is from uh, Kelsey Montgomery. Uh, is storage on Syniac in the cloud such that uh, compute can be performed without moving any data? So um, I suppose I didn't make this clear, but uh, Syniac is completely file-based. So that is um, that is one of the cases that Snack is not built for. So um, yeah, everything is a file-based system. In my personal case, I um, will run things on a cluster that you can um, you can have things separately, but not in the way that you are describing, not in a typical cloud computing sense. Um, all right, so if, uh, we have time for one more. Um, how would Syniac work in terms of data portability or archived compressed data? Would there be a need for some speed pre-processing to get it up to speed? So I would like to talk to you more of this after um, so I can ask some clarifying questions, but um, people have used Syniac um, for archiving data uh, specifically through the University of Michigan, um, and that requires you, you can, because you can export it to that nested directory structure where everything is nicely labeled for you. It's best to export it and then um, condense it, essentially. But I'm happy to talk about that offline. All right. Well, we'll uh, move the uh, question over to the Q and A in Slack. And thank you so much for, for a really great presentation. Thank you.